the one. <laughs> we the ones they talking about. <laughs> Broadway Sports Media. Choose your fighter. Justin and Justin Titans podcast show. Some of it was bad, but hopefully you'll you probably piece something together. Outstanding. There's an earthquake in the middle of the podcast. Unbelievable. We're begging for listeners. That's all we do. We all we got. Hey, Titans on three. One, two, three. Nine. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by the Pharmacy, Burger Parlor, and Beer Garden in partnership with Broadway Sports Media and 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me, as always, Justin Mello. And boy, do we have a pretty exciting episode today. Oh, man. We cannot wait to uh, make this announcement of what Graver and I just produced for the last hour or so. Graver's dedication, he was up at 5 a.m. Um, <laughs> so we could make this happen. It's not You're not, you're not going to hear it and listen to it right now uh, on this episode, but we will tell you um, what is what it's about. And I think you're all going to be very... I, I honestly think it's the best piece of content Braver and I have ever produced. I agree with that. So we just spent, yeah, the last hour or so breaking down 10 plays of Will Levis's 2021 film with his college quarterbacks coach and offensive coordinator from that 2021 season, Liam Cohen. And at the end of this podcast episode, we're going to play a brief interview we did with Cohen after the uh, the tape breakdown session, which is going to be on YouTube and in a separate article on broadwaysportsmedia.com. So that's going to be awesome, and we're super excited to share it with everybody. But let's get into today's podcast. So we're going to talk about what we learned from the first week of Titans OTAs. Uh, Something that we sort of talked about last week was the veteran presence. Well, Kevin Byard, Christian Fulton, and a handful of other guys not present. Does this mean anything? Is it, you know, a case-by-case scenario where we're going to look at Bayard and Fulton and some of the other guys a little differently? Tier Tart hasn't signed the uh, tender yet, but he's out there playing on like a waiver that he had to sign. So he's there. Kevin Bayard, apparently, he and Mike Vrabel were seen together. Mike Vrabel said he saw Bayard at the golf course the, pa- the weekend prior to OTAs. Christian Fulton, you know, the way Mike Vrabel said he wasn't there didn't sound nearly as like it's cool as it did with Bayard. So what do you make of all this? Yeah, the Bayard stuff is at least borderline interesting because of the contract, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, they, they had confirmed that they had asked him to take a pay cut and that he had said no. That was confirmed by general manager Rand Carthon, who then said there hasn't been no trade request or any trade discussions. But it is still kind of interesting, I think, a little that he's not there. The Fulton one, you know, he's, a, a, of course, working on the side. I think Teron Davenport confirmed where he's working and, and with what trainer he's working. Hmm. But you're right. Vrabel didn't sound thrilled. I mean, these guys are in two totally different positions, right? You remember last year, actually, at the end of the year, when Vrabel brought up Fulton's name as one of those guys that's been injury prone next to David Long, he actually used Kevin Byard as a positive example, right? He goes, Kevin hasn't pulled a hammy since I've been here in Tennessee, <laughs> right? So it's like these guys are on opposite sides of the yeah. spectrum in terms of the amount of trust that they've earned from Mike Vrabel. So that's why he kind of can brush, uh, you know, Kevin Byard not being there off. And then he's, he's pissed about Christian Fulton not being there, right? Because Fulton's entering a contract year. It's a big year for him. Maybe that's why he's staying away. We don't know, right? Is his agent trying to negotiate an extension? Do they feel like he's earned a contract extension? In all honesty, if that if that's how they feel, I, I think they would be misreading the situation, right? Based on the amount of games that he's missed. And he's been a good football player when he's on the field, but that consistency with health hasn't always been there. And he's not a shut down number one corner, right? That can just stay away and demand a contract extension. So whether it's that or whether he wants to try something different with his body, I mean, that one would maybe, you could at least maybe say one plus one equals two. If he's saying, look, I've been hurt. I've been banged up. It's I got to switch up the routine in an effort to try to stay healthier than I've been. But it is very interesting. And Vrabel did not sound pleased. Yeah, definitely did not. And so that's something that we'll just keep tracking and see, you know, mandatory mini camp is coming up. Um, in June. So that's when these things will really start mattering because this is still all voluntary, but it does go a little bit against what we were talking about last week with the buy-in from the veteran guys. It's still nice to see your your true team leaders like Ryan Tannehill, Derek Henry, Jeffrey Simmons there, but you would say Kevin Byard is in that group of of true team leaders. Of course. And he's not there. So so something to keep an eye on. Um, something I want to talk about that we that was coming out of the camp. So the way the reports work, like you can't really talk about who's working with what team and working where, but we do have it on pretty good authority that Peter Skaronsky was working with the first team at left guard 
second team at left tackle. So we know already that they are working that versatility we talked about. Signals that maybe they do view him as the swing tackle, even though he is also currently viewed as the starting left guard. Sort of what we expected, but nice to get confirmation more or less. Yeah, like I like I think I've said on previous episodes, it, it doesn't surprise me because all their best backup linemen are interior guys, right? Like if someone has to come out of that lineup, you try to get Corey Levin in there as potentially your sixth offensive lineman or maybe Jamarco Jones, who's got some inside-outside versatility, but they've preferred him at guard throughout the very short amount of time he's actually been on the field with the team going into his second year here. So you're picking those guys ahead of a Jalen Duncan, right? A sixth round pick out of Maryland or the UDFA tackle out of Boise state or your second year tackle out of, uh, I can't remember what school it was now uh, where Andrew Rupsich played. It was a very something Stockton. I think if I recall correctly, <laughs> yeah, like, like re, yeah, real Culver Stockton. It just came to Culver, Culver Stockton, Stockton where Andrew <laughs> Rupsich went. So if you're getting one of these guys on the field, you're, you're going with Jamarco Jones or Corey Levin. So it might make more sense and you don't love shuffling things around, but based on the personnel you have, have if Andre Dillard goes down, for example, probably makes more sense to kick Skaronsky out to the left tackle and either you're placing Corey Levin or Jamarco Jones at left guard. You, you don't want to mess with it too much, but maybe you even kick Aaron Brewer back to left guard and put Corey Levin at center, right? So they have options. It's good to have that versatility. It's, it's good to have choices to make, but ultimately if Dillard goes down, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Skaronsky at left tackle on that topic. You don't even know this, but I'm just going to announce something else uh, <laughs> that that's going to be fun for our listeners. I spent like an hour last week with the O-line coach at Northwest and Kurt Anderson talking about Peter Skaronsky. Um, We talked a lot of ball. I think you guys are going to love it. It's one of the better pieces I've produced this year. He's coached a lot of pros, Coach Anderson, for not just Skaronsky, NFL ball. And you're going to be all very excited about what he had to say about Peter Skaronsky. Nice. Yeah, we can't wait for that one too. Thanks. Um, good promo there. So another thing that, that we talked about on the last podcast that – we saw play out a little bit. I, I theorize that maybe Elijah Molden could be making a little move to safety. And it seems like <laughs> that might be really the case. Uh, Mike Vrabel offered this information freely at a press conference without being prompted or asked about it, that Elijah Molden has been working a lot at safety now. So could he be, I mean, we talked last week, we both agreed, like he's probably not, you know, you're like third on the depth chart safety if Byard or Hooker goes down, but maybe he is. <laughs> What a call by you. Pat yourself <laughs> on the back. That's incredible stuff, right? And and I think it makes a lot of sense in the, in the context that you and I spoke of it about where he's probably not, you know, the traditional starting safety if one of those guys gets hurt. But you talk about the Andrew Adams role from last year where he played a lot of man coverage, played zone two where he could read the quarterback's eyes. Andrew Adams, remember, he had that amazing pick six against the Colts. You look at what Josh Kalou did for them down the stretch as well. Um, I think that's sort of the, the third safety role they're envisioning for Elijah Molden. When they go heavy on DBs on the field, obvious passing downs, you want to get smaller, you want to get faster. There's no reason you can't have Kevin Byard, Amani Hooker, Elijah Molden, Christian Fulton, you know, Roger McCreary, whoever else on the field. And uh, that's a really you know tough group to play against as a passing offense yeah it could potentially turn a position of weakness into a position of strength if he can make that transition cleanly and you know he played a lot of it in college safety that is and that's like we said you know his role's been around the box already since he's been in Tennessee that that yeah you mentioned the pick six against the Colts and stuff so we've seen him make plays in that type of role before it shouldn't be too big of a transition so that's really interesting another thing that's really interesting so I'm basing this next thing off of something that Easton Freeze said on a Twitter Spaces last week um, after one of, after the practice that was open to the media. And um, basically, we all know Mike Vrabel said that Will Levis is behind Malik Willis and Ryan Tannehill to start, you know, as he should be. You got to earn your spot as a, as a rookie coming in there with guys that have already been on the team. But according to Easton, Ryan Tannehill and Will Levis were sort of rotating a little bit uh, when they got to the seven on seven and the team periods and that Malik Willis was on a separate field working with the twos while Tannehill and Levis were sort of rotating in working with the ones. And we know there was like a rookie period at the end of the practice. So maybe it, part of it was that. Um, but what do you make of Will Levis, you know, already sort of 
being on the same field as Ryan Tannehill while Malik Willis is off working on a side field. Does that say anything about where they are? Or, I mean, do we kind of already I mean, know where this is headed anyway? <laughs> it's it's certainly interesting. I'm only going with Easton's point here because it, it would almost contradict what Vrabel previously said about, oh, Levis is going to be the three, Malik is our two, and he's going to work with the threes. Um, I would guess he's just been very impressive. Well, you know, which you and I have, I would say, on pretty good account. Right, that he that he's a very intelligent guy and, and has been very impressive. So, right. uh, you know, they, they're, they're ramping things up a little quicker for him than they probably initially planned, and uh, I think they're very very excited about what they have in Will Levis. Yeah, and uh, speaking of that, should we get to what we talked about with Liam Cohen here? But right after we do our beef of the week, presented by the Pharmacy Burger Parlor and Beer Garden. Anything Absolutely. else? Absolutely. So, my I, I got one for you. Okay, cool. My beef of the week is with Titans fans that are saying um, the Titans don't check any boxes for DeAndre Hopkins in mm. free agency. That's a topic you and I are going to talk about a little bit quickly. Uh, um, the Cardinals finally released him from his contract. Got nothing in return. I mean, what a disaster. <laughs> DeAndre Hopkins, Buffalo Bills. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs are teams that come to mind. But, you know, I... I, I, I do think you got to take the Mike Vrabel and Tim Kelly uh, a factor into equation here where he played for both of those coaches in Houston, had some of the best years commented on how much he likes Vrabel, by the way. I found a quote from a couple of years ago where he talked about how much he loves Coach Vrabel. And then, of course, Tim Kelly, the offensive coordinator there, overseeing some of the best years of his career. And, and this is a beef of the week also in relation to Ryan Tan. Hill because I don't, you know, oh, you know, Tannehill. I don't think NFL receivers look at Ryan Tannehill as a bad quarterback. I don't think NFL players think Ryan Tannehill is a bad quarterback, not by any stretch of the imagination. I remember when was it Pat McAfee uh, last year? It's a random point for me to bring up, but Aaron Rodgers was on the Pat McAfee show. Was it last year or the year before? Titans were off to a bit of a slow start. And I don't know how they started talking about the Titans, but they did. <laughs> and Aaron Rodgers, I remember saying to McAfee, he goes, this is just a, a reputation thing around the league. It goes to show you, right? And look, C- Rodgers was in the other conference. In the NFC, Titans not a common opponent. I remember Rodgers saying to Pat McAfee, he goes, oh, they still have got Ryan Tannehill, a quarterback, and they're still running that, that bang play action with him. Yeah, they're going to be just fine. I remember Aaron. And he, and he was right. They were. They ended up going on, on a hot streak and played well down the stretch. Um so that, that, I think that's sort of more the reputation that the Titans had and that Ryan Tannehill's had. And people still remember what they've done in the playoffs, right? Getting to the AFC Championship game a couple of years ago, winning the division back-to-back years, several winning seasons in a row before you know things kind of fell off the, the train tracks here in the, in the last couple of games uh, last year. But right. I, think, I do think Ryan Tannehill has a good reputation. And I think if the money was right, people always underrate the money factor. Hopkins is, what, 30-31, last chance for him to cash in potentially. Uh, if they come in with a good offer and I'm not saying they should, I think there's a fair debate there, whether they should or shouldn't based on the history of, you know, with Robert Woods and Julio Jones, and you could go further back with Andre Johnson and Randy Moss. Although I don't (laughs) think Hopkins is at that point, right? He's not 36, 35 years old and completely washed like those guys were. But um, I, I think it's unfair to totally write the Titans off based on Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, I like that one. I think that, you know, that's a good way to combine our Beef of the Week segment with the big news swirling after the Cardinals released Hopkins. So, I mean, I, as a fan, it would be awesome to see as a, like... For sure. Just person covering the team. Like, I don't know that it makes that much sense. It depends on, again, we keep talking about this all offseason, where the Titans view themselves, what plans they may or may not have for Tannehill and Henry, if they are looking to be, like, players at the trade deadline, sellers at the trade deadline, and get Will Levis in there, like... We have no idea what they're planning to do or how they're planning to make the money work. They could make it work. If they wanted to sign him to a one-year deal, they could add void years. If they wanted to offer a huge contract, which apparently everything it sounds like is that Hopkins is looking for money more than anything, more than a chance a chance to compete or whatever. Like Shocking. Yeah, yeah right? Money's important. <laughs> um, there is a lot of like rumors connecting him with the Browns where he would be reuniting with Deshaun Watson. So we'll kind of have to keep an eye on that, but... I mean, you mentioned the connections he has to the Titans, so they're the Titans coaching staff. So that, I don't know. I wouldn't rule it out. I'm not expecting it, but I wouldn't rule it out either. Same. And remember, Rand Carthon, he said a few weeks ago when they talked about upgrading at receiver, he said, well, there are going to be opportunities. Guys are going to get cut. Yeah. And things of that nature. So, like, 
some Titans fans are acting like we shouldn't even be having this conversation. And that's downright silly, right? Like, look, sometimes, again, and I, I use this phrase already, but one plus one equals two. They've got a huge hole at receiver, right? They've got the worst step chart in the NFL to position and a really good, potentially bona fide number one receiver just became available through, he was released from his contract. Like, yeah, of course, there's at least got to be a discussion there, right? Like, and again, he talked about, the, look, the GM talked about looking at guys that are going to get cut. He said that weeks ago, in the next couple of weeks, there are guys that are going to be cut. Well, guess what? There isn't going to be a better receiver cut than DeAndre Hopkins. And look, you can argue the money. You could argue the age, the the, the, the injuries. I get all that. And that's why I'm, I'm not saying they got to go after him hard here. I, I understand all the counterpoints. But in terms of reputation, pure ability, what he's capable of when he's healthy, there's not going to be a better receiver that comes available than DeAndre Hopkins. Right. So maybe that's exactly who Rand Carthon may have been talking about. You know, the Titans in front office and the Cardinals front office are in communication. Like, did the Titans reach out about a potential trade, find out the Cardinals plans, planning to cut? Like, we'll see how it all unfolds. But I am with you on B for the week, like for people just writing off the Titans as a possible option. So that's a good one. All right. Um, that's all we got, right? Any, any other thoughts about OTAs or anything before we get to Cohen? No, I think that does it. We've got, and I want to clarify for our listeners. So this Liam Cohen interview that you're about to hear, current offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at Kentucky, was the OC with the Los Angeles Rams last year. And before that was the OC and quarterback coach at Kentucky in 2021 when Will Levis played his best football. And before that was at the Rams as an offensive assistant. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So uh, Cohen's playing the, the musical chairs here with the Rams in Kentucky. But <laughs> this interview you're about to hear with him it's not the same one, what you're going to hear and watch on the YouTube uh, film session that Graver and I did. This is a separate interview. It's an exclusive to this podcast That's with right. Liam Cohen. So you're not going to hear the same thing twice. But when you do get to watch the, the video that you know we're currently still in the process of editing, Graver putting his magic finishing touches on it. Um, when you do watch that, I think it's going to blow you away. We broke down 10 plays with Liam Cohen of Will Levis from 20 and every play we brought up. And I got to give you a shout out Graver because you pulled all the plays, every yes. play we pulled up. And first of all, his photographic memory, right? Like before oh you God. hit play, that was crazy. He, he every play <laughs> didn't even, it was from the coaches film, all 22 from the sideline angle before the snap, just like the formation and the defensive alignment. And he's like, Oh, this is a good one. Like for every single so play. <laughs> he was so thrilled and impressed with your play select. Like, I feel like if we allowed him to dictate, he might have pulled the same plays, like Some in the exact sure. order that you pulled them <laughs> in. So, um, this, again, we cannot wait for you guys to see this. I, I'm very confident this is some of the best content Graver and I have ever produced. I'd put it number one. And in all, if we never produce something better, I'm okay with that. In all honesty, because this is that good. But first, before you get to that, it's the perfect appetizer, the perfect teaser. You're about to hear a separate exclusive interview with Cohen, who has spoken with Will uh, recently since he's been with the Titans. So we talked about some of that. Will's reaction to OTAs and all that. So I think you're really going to love this interview as well. Yeah. All right. So let's go get to it. Without further ado, let us now welcome Liam Cohen onto the Music City Audible podcast. Coach, thanks for being here. Um, let's just dive right in. Justin, take it away. By all intents and purposes, Coach, every report coming out of training camp is that he's picking up, you know, OTAs. He's picking up everything quickly. Like they've been very impressed with him. Um, you've spoken to him, as you mentioned. I get the sense that that doesn't shock you, that he's picking up things so quickly down there. No, I mean, he picked up our offense fairly quickly and it was completely new terminology, a lot of new things. And, and what they're asking him to do is even a lot, a lot more um, detailed than what we asked him to do. I mean, he's making mic points in the run game, pass game protections. He's doing a lot of things that ultimately lead to great success from a quarterback standpoint down the line, down the road. But early on, it can really freak you out. I mean, it can really, you know, slow you, your process down. Um, I don't think that that's going to be an issue with Will. I, all that that I've heard coming out of, you know, OTAs and what he's mentioned to me about some of the practices and preparation. I mean, he says hard, and, and, but he loves it, and, and he loves to compete and loves to go through this process. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like working with Will in terms of, like, teaching him concepts and his ability to like ask questions and understand. Cause we heard about his incredible score on the S2 cognition test. And we've seen some clips of him, like asking the right questions at yeah. like the rookie stuff with the Manning brothers. And just what was it like working with him on that front? 
like you guys mentioned, is an extremely intelligent person. Take away football. I mean, he was raised by unbelievably educated people that are extremely sharp and intelligent. He's extremely sharp and intelligent person. Um, so when you do prepare with Will, you need to make sure as a coach, your 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 eyes are dotted and your T's are crossed. Like <laughs> you better make sure that the game plan's tight, and that you try not to leave as much gray area in there because. Ultimately, every quarterback wants to be told what to do with the ability to be able to change if they need to. But they like to have a criteria and have an understanding of what we're trying to get accomplished. And then sometimes, you know, you have to improvise and make a play, but that's why you play the game. So he was really fun to honestly game plan with because I'd ask him, hey, man, can you do this? And he said, yeah. But he'd be honest, like about things he wasn't comfortable with or didn't really love but there wasn't many times where you said as a coach hey will can you do this or can you read this or can you use this footwork where he wouldn't at least go try it and see how it would go and sometimes i'd be the one ah man you know what we don't need that we don't need to use that (laughs) like let's just let's move on we got other things we're good at you know and but the openness and willingness to try a lot of times for nfl quarterbacks is hard like you're stuck in a certain way and you want to do it this way and you feel comfortable. He's a blank canvas. You can kind of do what you want with him. <laughs> Amazing. One thing that really strikes me as interesting, Coach, is this is a room that he's going into that's got some moving pieces, right? A, a veteran, you know, aging starter with Ryan Tannehill. They had drafted another quarterback a year before that in Malik Willis. Yep. Uh, not that different from when he first got into your room in 2021 right. where he arrived a little late. Right. You guys had him working with the threes initially. You know, Mike Vrabel has said the same thing. Oh, he's going to work with the threes. I mean, that's typical yep. NFL, typical Vrabel. Like he's going to have to earn his way and, and work his way up the depth chart compared to the guys that got there before him. How do you think that experience at Kentucky and how he worked through that is going to help him in this you know first few months with the Titans here? Yeah, Justin, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, all of this kid has done is had to earn it. I mean, that's it. I mean, Penn State, yeah. he, he didn't he didn't give he wasn't given anything at Penn State. He just competed his tail off when he was given the opportunities and became a glorified running back. And got them a lot of first downs and touchdowns and did a lot of good things for them in the role that he was asked to play. Nice. And then he comes in and like you guys mentioned, he's behind the eight ball. He missed a whole spring. These kids had a whole spring ahead of him to really you know, honing in on the offense and reps and timing with the receivers, everything. And he came in and earned the starting job, and it wasn't even close within days. And um, that was because of the time that he put in. But also, I mean, like you guys mentioned, we put him with the threes for him to earn it, knowing that it would probably go that way. But for the players, at one point, I forget, they started coming to us saying, like, guys, coach, like, <laughs> When, when are you guys going to, like, play him with the ones? I mean, this is crazy. You know, this is getting crazy. But that's what you want. You want the players to be the ones to come in and say, let's go. This is our quarterback. Because that's when you have good teams, right? Like, that's when you have player-led teams. That's when you have good teams. And it wasn't some transfer, my guy narrative that was going to be pushed. Like, that wasn't going to happen. Coach Stoops wasn't going to allow that to happen, not to his program. And so um, it was done the right way. And I think that's what really everybody respects about the way Will goes about his business because they know he has not been handed anything. Right. Incredible stuff. We're we're so excited as Titans fans who get to cover this team and to get to watch Will. And, and uh, you know, one day he's going to take over, whether it's this year because of injury or something else or trade of something crazy. We're going to be ready for it. And it's, it's going to be exciting. Yeah, hopefully he can just continue to learn and get better and and learn how to be a pro. And whenever that does happen, we'll be watching in Lexington. (laughs) Nice. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. 
All right, thanks again to Coach Liam Cohen. That was incredible. We are gonna wrap up this episode with that. So thanks to everyone for listening. Look out for this video that is coming to broadwaysportsmedia.com, coming to YouTube, the Broadway Sports channel. We will tweet about it when it's ready to go. We don't have a like a date yet, because like you said, I gotta edit it and everything. So we'll finish it up and get it out there as soon as we can, because we're really excited for you guys to see it. All right, that's it. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to the Pharmacy, Burger Parlor, and Beer Garden again. And follow Justin on Twitter at Justin M underscore NFL. You can follow me at Titans Film Room. Again, broadwaysportsmedia.com. All this great content will be there soon, including your your conversation with the Northwestern O-line coach and obviously our video uh, interview with and, the... Yeah. And sorry, you just you reminded me, you said all this great content. I just had an interview published right now with Titans UDFA wide receiver Jacob Copeland. Uh, mm. That's out. And that's an exclusive. We've got another one coming later this week with the, the UDFA kicker, Trey Wolf. Mm. So I've got that interview. Like, I, nice. The content's coming at you from all angles. Um, I'll, I'll hype something up that's a couple of weeks away. In addition to the Northwestern uh, piece I did with Skaronsky, I got with Tajay Spears' running back coach at Tulane. We talked about the ACL, the knee, the health of the knee, all that. So there's going to be some really good exclusives there coming. I think that one's going to publish in, in, in a few weeks, mid-June. I also got with Colton Dowell's receiver coach uh talked about how can he contribute right away i got another udfa interview coming next week that's not trey wolf or jacob copeland because those I, again are coming this week i mean the content's coming at you from all angles folks big time even though it's the off season it's never the off season right so we got it we got it coming to you so all right that'll do it thanks to everyone again for listening and we will be back next week to continue talking about the titans whatever's going on with otas and everything else so we'll be back then until then you guys stay safe out there and tighten up A Broadway Sports Media Production.